Amen, amen. Remain standing for just a moment. I'm going to uh, read the, 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 uh, the scripture for tonight that we're going to dive into. But I just want to uh, uh, give honor where honor is due. There's one thing I've learned about honor, and that, that's that it's never redundant, and it's always appropriate, right? Amen. And uh, I just want to honor our pastors and, and just say thank you, uh, man and woman of God, uh, for allowing me to, to minister tonight, to share tonight. They are, of course, in uh, the Nashville area at a pastor's conference, I'm told. Uh, so they're being refreshed and poured into. Aren't you thankful that, that we can allow them to, to go and be refreshed in the presence of the Lord? Come on, yeah, put your hands together for them and for a great team of volunteers at the Lift Church that can, that can hold the fort down while they get away for a little bit and get refreshed. And we're just thankful uh, for that opportunity. Well, uh, before I keep you standing for too much longer, I just want to read uh, out of our, our theme verse. Of course, we've been in a, a, a series on emotional baggage, emotional uh, bondage, and we're, I'm just going to tag team with Pastor Keith tonight uh, and read this, this verse real quick. It's in 2 Corinthians verse six, uh, or chapter 6, verse 12. It says, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Father, we just come to you, Lord. We just fill the atmosphere with your word right now, Lord. And we just know, Father, that the entrance of your word brings light, brings light into our life, Father, and lights our path. So, Father, we open up our hearts, open up our minds, open our ears to receive all that you have for us tonight, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would put me on and wear me like a coat. Let my, my tongue be that the pen of a ready writer, Father, and grant me access to every heart, life, and mind, Father, under the sound of my voice tonight, Father, that, that your word would come forth in power and boldness and clarity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. As you're seated, uh, find two or three and, and greet and shake hands tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we have been uh, in a powerful series on, like I said, emotional bondage and emotional uh, baggage. And it was, as Pastor Keith said, it was kind of an impromptu series, but the Lord had it, us here um, and has highlighted some things along the way. And, and I'm just anxious and Glad to, to be able to come along and, and tag team uh, with Pastor Keith in this series. And I just believe there's, there's just something about this, this series that, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, grace us or, or, or pet us, you know, in, in the areas that, that we want to be comforted. It kind of deals with some things that are difficult to confront sometimes, I believe, in the life of every believer, in, in the life of, of humanity. There's just a humanity about us that we all are emotional beings, right? All of us deal with emotions, all of us deal with mindsets and, and things, but it sometimes is, is difficult to really get honest with ourselves and come to the place where we can uh, apprehend freedom, if you will, where we can receive the freedom of Jesus because sometimes we as people just like to suppress things about our emotions, right? We like to suppress things about our attitudes and, and, and maybe even convince ourselves that they're not as bad as they really are or they're not as, as weight-bearing as they really are in our lives. So I just wanna uh, dive into this tonight. You uh, remember that, that Pastor Keith gave us an acronym last week for baggage um, and he asked me just to, to flow into that and to, to just break it down and, and, and really highlight some things. So it's gonna be a little practical, a little teaching tonight, but I believe it's gonna be a, a benefit to, the, to, to us as a people and it's gonna take us and help us get from glory to glory, amen? So in this verse, in this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, you're not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. You remember Pastor highlighted that the, the word affections there means the inward parts, the heart. It's the seat of the feelings, right? So affections is, is the seat of the feelings. It's the emotional aspect of our, our minds. It's the emotional aspect of our soul. It's, it's the, the, the heartbeat of, of who we are. It's, it, it deals a lot with the inner man, the inner personality, the inner uh, behaviors and characteristics that we all assume 
by one way or another, they just come, right? We, we, we are react, reactionary creatures. We're, humanity just reacts to things. And before you know it, when we react and we have a, a, a certain reaction, we can begin to absorb all kinds of baggage, right? We're bombarded on a daily basis with events, circumstances, really because of social media, that's made it tremendously more vital. It's made it tremendously higher volume of things that you're getting bombarded with that you know, 30, 40 years ago, people just didn't hear about the bad news that we have access to at, the, at our fingertips today, right? We've, we, we, can, we, we get so bombarded with society, with, with news headlines and things that can make us and cause us to react and without realizing it, all these things that are coming at us, all these circumstances of life that come at us quick can begin to put emotional baggage on us. But it's, the object, objective is not to live free from emotions, right? We're not, we're not denying that God made us emotional creatures. I'm not denying or, or minimizing the idea that, that God created us with emotions, right? Emotions are powerful. They, they, they are uh, a, a resource to us. They are a, a, a way and a means by which we experience life. They give us feeling that, that, that is, is really a, a powerful uh, motivator in many ways. And they're, they're good in their place, right? You've heard... A uh, pastor shared this quote that, that they say about money. Money makes a good servant, but a terrible master, right? It makes a good servant, but a terrible master. And that's the same, can, the same can be said about emotions. Emotions make a good servant, but a terrible master. So it's not about walking free from emotions. It's, walking and, it's learning how to live in control of them, right? We got to live in control of, of our emotions and understand that there's an aspect, there's a demand on us as believers now that we don't have to walk dictated by our emotions, dictated by whatever that baggage that comes along in our life. And we have to realize that we've got to be redeemed, right? We have to be redeemed, not, not just redeemed in our spirit, but redeemed in our soul, redeemed in our, in our thinking redeemed in our reactions, in our responses, in how we behave, how we plan, how we go about our daily business, our daily lives. Everything about us comes under the blood of Jesus when we, when we say yes to him, right? Everything comes surrendered to, the, blood, to, the, to the, the lordship of Jesus Christ and is washed by his blood. And we don't wanna, we don't wanna hold on to certain aspects of a past life because it, 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 it soothes us or, or keeps us comfortable, but we wanna, we wanna learn to be free and fully redeemed. Amen. Paul says, it's not us who are restricting you, but it is your own affection. So he clarifies, it's not us. You know, see, we, we always try to, when we, get, when we feel restricted, we're always looking to point the finger at someone else, right? We're always looking to, to blame someone else is at fault for why we can't get further down the road. We're always, that's just human nature. We just try to find, play the blame game and try to figure out, well, it's because so-and-so did this to me 30 years ago and therefore I can't get past it. You know, we always try to point the, 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 the finger, but when we feel restricted, we've gotta realize that it's likely due to the, our own affections. It's due to our own feelings. It's due to, due to our own mindsets that have ensnared us. That word, uh, uh, it, that word uh, restricted, it's, it's, a, it's a, a smallness, it's a, it's a, a, a choking out, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's really just bondage, right? And Jesus says in Luke 21, verse 34, this is the Amplified, he says, but take heed to yourselves and be on your guard, lest your hearts be overburdened and depressed. Or That word is weighed down, be, to become heavy laden, to be depressed to be weighed down with the giddiness and the headache and the nausea of self-indulgence, drunkenness and worldly worries and cares pertaining to the business of this life, unless that day come upon you suddenly like a trap or a noose. Lest that day come upon, what day is he talking about? He's talking about the return of the Lord. He's talking about the day of the Lord. And it's possible for us to be so consumed as people, we can come to a place where we're so consumed by our own anxieties, our own affections, that the day of the Lord would come upon us quickly in a surprise-like fashion. It would come upon us suddenly, meaning we, would be, we wouldn't be prepared. But how many want to be prepared for that day, amen? We don't want to be caught 
with our eyes on, on worldly affections, on our, with our eyes constantly reacting to everything that comes at us rather than learning how to respond with the mindset and character of Christ, right? So, if we're going to walk free from emotional baggage, we have to get real with ourselves. We've gotta look inward, we gotta examine our hearts and come to a place where we call it what it is. It's baggage. And anything that, that weighs you down and keeps you out of the plan of God, let's just call it what it is, it's sin, right? We've gotta, we've gotta be honest with ourselves and come to a place where we confess, Lord, this is an area of sin. I may not have realized it, I may not like it, I may not understand it fully, but if this is weighing me down, if this is preventing me and prohibiting me from entering into the next level in your goodness, your glory, your, your likeness, then I am in sin, right? First Peter five, verse seven says, casting the whole of your cares, how much? The whole thing, all of it, all of your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all. How many know Christ dealt with, with sin once and for all, right? Amen. He dealt with it at the cross, it's on him. He carries that, that burden now. But there's a realm, there's a reality where we sometimes like to grab that back and carry it around and show it off like a trophy, right? We like to fill our arms with all this baggage. But it says, for he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. He cares, he cares. He's not insensitive to the events, the circumstances, the situations that you've endured. He's not insensitive to that. He's, he, he's a merciful, loving God, right? He knows, he knows what you've been through. He knows where you've been. But he's calling you, he's inviting you into his glory, into a, a place, a realm of understanding, of stability, of steadiness, where those things no longer have the grip that they have on you. They no longer have the grip on our lives. They no longer have the, the clutch on our lives. So let's walk through this, this acronym. You'll remember it's baggage. So B A G G A G E. So I'm gonna I'm gonna walk through this and we're just gonna highlight some areas practically tonight of areas of baggage. Areas of baggage and what baggage is so that we can touch and get specific because sometimes what we like to do, and I, I'm guilty of this too, is as people, we like to think, oh well, that's great for so and so. I know they've got a lot of baggage, right? But <laughs> In the meantime, if you open up my trunk, I've got a whole lot more than they do, and I don't wanna tell nobody about it, right? So we've gotta, we've gotta come to the place where we get specific and deal with these things, and I believe these nights have been crucial in this series to help identify and highlight some areas that maybe we've not realized. We've been dealing with baggage or carrying baggage that the Lord wants to free us from, and it's, it, it, he can free you tonight from it. He can, he can do in five minutes what you've been trying all your life to get free from, right? He can break that thing, and release you from it in Jesus' name. So, B, the first B is uh, for bondage. Whether you realize it or not, baggage is just bondage that can be mobilized with you. I'm gonna say that again. Baggage is just bondage that can be mobilized with you. What do I mean? It's deceptive. Because we think physical bondage, we think it's keeping us tied down to something. Baggage, though, is bondage that you can get to a certain degree or a destination. It may not be the destination that God intends for you to go. You may not be able to go everywhere with it. There's going to be limitations and sometimes severe limitations because of the baggage you carry, but bondage it, 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 but bondage it is nonetheless, right? It restricts you. Baggage can go with you though, and because it's baggage, we tend to think we can cope with it better. We tend to think, well, I can carry this. It's not truly let it keeping me from my, from my destination. I can at least go some places with it. I can at least get around okay with it. I can at least cope with it. But it's not the fulfillment and the purpose of, uh, and plan of God in your life. It's not the fullness. It's a, a degree. You're settling, we're settling for a degree of fullness when he's called us to a greater level. So we've gotta get, we've gotta just call it what it is. It, it's baggage is bondage, right? It's bondage, it, it, can, it can be easier to cope with because it looks better than being chained or shackled to a, a spot and not being able to get loosed, but it is still restrictive. It is still restricting you. 
The word Paul uses is restricted. That word says it means to be narrowed. I already read some of this, but it means to be narrowed, to be compressed, to keep someone in a tight place. So it, 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 it's restrictive. It cuts off the flow. It cuts off the ability to fully be participative of, of what, what God wants to do in your life. It's, it, it prevents you from going to the glory, to the, to the dimension of his glory that he's called you to walk in, the, 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 the level of the promise that he's placed on your life. It prevents you from getting to that next level in him. And so not all bondage comes from the devil. If we, if we, if we slow down and think about it, not all bondage is, is directly from the devil, right? Sometimes the bondage that we've, we've ensnared, become ensnared by is really a result of our own actions and our own choice to carry around the baggage. Sometimes it's not the devil that's placed that shackle, it's, it's you that has gone and picked up a bag somewhere along the way, and it's a heavy bag, it's a burdensome bag, but you're so uh, reliant and dependent on it, you've become so accustomed to it, and you've learned how to cope with it, that you lug that thing around, we lug that thing around everywhere we go, looking for a way out and not realizing that all we have to do is just let go. We've got to learn to let go in, in Christ. So it comes sometimes as a, res, as a result of experiences. Sometimes it's not necessarily something that we particularly asked for, but if something happens to us, we sometimes run to go find a way, well, this, this justifies this baggage now, and I'll just forever carry, because this happened to me. It wasn't my choice. It wasn't by my, my own actions. It just happened to me. It was a result of something out of my control, but it now it just becomes a, a, a area that I can now hold on to and walk around with it, and it restricts us. Second Corinthians uh, chapter six, verse uh, 11 through 13, in the message, so it's the same verse, but in the message, you'll remember Pastor quoted this, says, dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell how much I, lo- I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. This wide open, spacious life, unrestricted. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from where? Within you. The smallness that you're feeling, the smallness that you're feeling, church, is coming from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you are living them in a small way. You're choosing to live in the restriction of the baggage that you've clung to. You're choosing, you've made a conscious choice to carry around the weight that you were never designed to carry. You are making a conscious effort to carry, to live in a small and restricted way, but how much I long for you to come to this wide open, spacious life where you can live free from every bit of baggage, every bit of bondage. You can live free from the stronghold of your mind. Baggage does not only affect you, it affects those around you. It's not only an internal battle, it's not only an internal inconvenience to you, but it's affecting people around you, whether you realize it or not. Though it's not physical, there's a weightiness and a gloominess that you inevitably carry everywhere you go as long as you're carrying baggage, emotional baggage, emotional weight. You are walking in this gloominess, this unsettledness. There's a, an aura about your, your the, when you walk in a room, there's going to inevitably be something that doesn't sit well with people if you're walking with that much baggage. There's gonna be something. Yes, Christ can overcome all sorts of things and overcomes our weakness, but how many don't wanna make it any harder for him to come in? How many just wanna live free in a place where we just say, Jesus, you can take the baggage, you can, you can take all this and let my life just be a living example of you in me, right? We all wanna live that way. We all wanna live in that place of freedom and we don't want to allow what has happened to us to creep into our interactions with other people because that gets in the way of, of what God wants to do through you in somebody's life because it, it gets filtered through those things that you're carrying. So it inhibits our relationships, it inhibits our interactions with people as we go about our daily life. Can you imagine if I walked with just tons of bags everywhere I'd go? If I just, you know, just picture me walking around in church, coming with you know, 10, 20, 15 bags on, on, you know, on, strapped around my back or on my neck, or hanging off my arms, it would affect where I can go, 
It would affect who, how close I can get to somebody, right? I'm gonna have to, if I come sit down with that many bags, nobody's on, on the, on the, gonna sit with me on the front row, right? There's gonna be bags stacked about four chairs wide. It's gonna limit how close I can get to people and how close I can interact with people. And I'm gonna, no doubt, be talking about it, right? People are gonna come up and say, where'd you get that one at? And I'm gonna be, oh, well, I got it for a deal over here. I got a, I got a good deal. Or, or, well, that one came from a thrift store. And, and, this, and it's going to affect my speech. It's going to affect how I talk to people and how I witness to people because it's going to be filtered through what preoccupies everything about my existence. I'm going to be walking around with these bags and everything about me, what you don't realize, what we don't realize as people is we don't realize how much it's actually flowing through us without us being intentional about talking about it. It begins to come out in our language. It begins to, we begin to give the devil glory. We begin to give, uh, you know, cadence to or adherence to what has happened to us, the, the issues of pain in our life, and we begin to glorify all these different areas and not live a life that points people to Jesus, right? Oh, yeah. So we've got to get free and, and leave those things behind so that we can live in the limitless freedom of Christ Jesus and live in that wide open, spacious life that Paul was talking about. So it affects everything about you. So let's look at the first one. A is attitudes. It's attitudes. These are, are difficult to identify because they're so... Really, a lot of these areas are difficult to identify because they're, they're, they're so elusive. They're so difficult to peg down because it's different for every person. We all have different ways of doing things. But Ephesians 4.23 says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, right? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Well, some translations actually translate that be renewed in the attitudes of your mind. To be renewed. So be, be born again, to be made new in the area of your attitudes, to be renewed in that place of thinking. Attitudes are just patterns or settled ways of thinking in the mind that dictate our interactions and our responses to the world around us. So they, they determine how we interact and how we, we, we respond to the things in our life. Your, you heard pastors say it last week, your altitude is determined by your attitude. How high you get, how far you go in God, is determined by your attitude. It's determined by the attitudes, the, the settled ways, the, 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 the ways of thinking in our mind. And I see this in, in, in workplace all the time. People that, that can be great workers, you've probably seen it too, can be great workers, can be smart, can be brilliant people, but have just, can we be real, a sorry attitude. They just have a bad attitude. And those people wonder why they don't get considered for promotions, right? They, don't, they, they wonder why they, 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 they live in a place of, of perpetual frustration, perpetual disappoint, disappointment, and they wonder why, well, I'm qualified, I can do this and this and this, but what the one thing they failed to realize is they're always complaining, they're always speaking sarcastically, which I'm the first one to tell you I can speak fluent sarcasm, right? We all, we all like to joke in, in sarcasm a little from time to time, but there is a place of danger with it, especially in, in places of interactions with people that aren't familiar with you and don't, may not take you the right way. If you get into that and that's just a, a part of who you are, you can come off and be perceived as having a bad attitude about things, right? You can be perceived as having a, 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 a bad perception. You can, you can be perceived as having a, a, a mindset that's not conducive to promotion. And no, bosses, managers, they're not gonna promote people with bad attitudes. Come on. They're not gonna, they're not gonna promote people with bad attitudes. You may be the best worker. You may be the smartest worker in the bunch. You may be the brightest crown in the crown box, right? But if you have a bad attitude, don't expect to get looked for for promotion, for, for acknowledgement. It's important. And we're always the first to deny a bad attitude, right? My wife can come home and say, you have a bad attitude. What's my response? No, no, I don't. What attitude? Oh, come on. You guys are looking at me like you've never said that. You know what I'm talking about. When someone asks you, you you've got a bad attitude. They call you out on it. What attitude? What are you talking about? We get so defensive about our attitude 
because we, we don't want to be we don't want to be guilty of of the, the just the, the what we're putting off, right? The uh, aura that we're, we're giving off, the, the the vibe that we're putting off, and the the tension that radiates from us when we're having a bad attitude. So we've got to allow. You may not realize, and it's not. It doesn't have to rear its head constantly for, you, for us to be guilty of this, right? Yeah. This isn't a, an issue where it's someone that, I'm not talking about people who are just constantly walking in a bad attitude. Sometimes, you know, we, we can, we can, if we're not careful, we can convince we're, ourselves we're okay because we only have a bad a- attitude on, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Yeah. If, you, if you're walking with a bad attitude at any point, it's time to get free, right? We don't wanna be people that are known for bad attitudes. So, Let's get free. Things we can ask ourselves. These, again, this is practical stuff tonight, but I believe it's gonna help us. Ask yourself, are you approachable? Are you approachable? When people come to you, are, are you approachable? Do you, do you make time, or are you always constantly in a, in a rush? Are you always constantly busy? Are you always constantly frustrated? Come on. Come on. Are you approachable? Do you speak sarcasm fluently? Ask yourself that. Are you just constantly just Ripping off sarcasm, right? I mean, just all day, everything. I've, I've known people at, at work that do that, and they just, that's literally just their lingo. They just, you go and ask them a question, and they're like, I don't know, is the sky blue? It's like, what, what is that gonna, how, what is that gonna accomplish? You're gonna, you're just trying to, to make it difficult on somebody. You're just trying to, these are things that just, that trip us up. They trip us up, and they keep us out of our potential, right? And it's not just your thoughts and your verbiage, it's not just what you say. Well, how's your body language? What kind of facial expressions do you give people? Do you react with your face so that you don't have to be guilty of what you say? Are you saying more with your facial expressions, your body language, than what you're really saying so that you can feel better and ease your conscience a little bit? Come on, I'm, I'm meddling a little bit tonight, but we're going somewhere. And it's, it's gonna, it's gonna bring freedom, I believe, by just identifying, getting these things out, so that getting these things up so they can come out, right? Yeah. The, the next area is a, another G, or a, the first G is guilt. Guilt. Guilt takes a variety of forms in our life. It's mistakes we've made, regrets that we've done, of what we've done, regrets of what we didn't do. Yet the emotion of guilt plays a vital role in our conviction. The emotion of guilt plays a vital role in conviction. It's feeling convicted and remorse are foundational for repentance, right? We've gotta feel that, that level of guilt. It's not something you're designed to walk in forever, but there is a reality, there is an emotion called guilt that you can experience and it will provoke you to repentance, right? The Lord uses it. But, and, and honestly, if, you're, if you aren't convicted, if you aren't sorry, if you won't feel remorseful, then it's a question of whether you're actually truly repentant, right? So there's a, there's a reality that we need to feel sorry. We need to feel that, that level of guilt for a, a, a short time, but unresolved guilt that doesn't produce repentance is just condemnation, okay? So unresolved guilt that doesn't lead to repentance, that doesn't lead to a turnaround, that doesn't lead to a changed behavior is just Condemnation. See, condemnation highlights the problem while conviction highlights the answer. Conviction is what makes you aware of the problem so that you can identify that you need the answer. See the difference? So condemnation leaves you in a place of hopelessness while conviction provokes you to a place of hope. It provokes you to see and identify your need for a savior. So Jesus is not the author of condemnation. He doesn't come to condemn. He came to take away all the guilt and shame off of our lives and bring us to the place of repentance so that we might be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We might be renewed and become born again in his likeness, in his character, and be free from the bondage and shackle of sin. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Why is that important? Why is it important that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus? Because guilt is recursive in its nature, meaning it's cyclical, it's a cycle. Guilt is a cycle. What what does that mean? Guilt creates actions 
that produce more guilt. Walking in, in, in the shame of guilt and, and carrying around the baggage of guilt and, and just believing that you're just guilty and there is no way out will inevitably produce more actions that produce more guilt. You'll begin to sin more because you're, you just feel guilty, so you just sin more as a guilty person does, and therefore you feel guilty again. And it's the cycle of sin that the devil loves to get the people of God, the people of this world, he loves to get them in that cycle, that vicious cycle of sin, ensnared and entrapped, because as long as he can keep you in the place of guilt and shame, he knows you're inevitably going to commit more actions that produce more guilt and shame. And he keeps you bound in, the, in, in that addictive lifestyle, that, that, that bondage of sin, knowing that as long as you stay quiet and don't confess it to anybody, you're gonna stay ensnared. You're gonna stay in the cycle. As long as he can isolate you, keep you ensnared, and keep you cool and calm and collected, and keep you feeling guilty, he knows you're just going to do as a guilty person does, and that is sin, right? So Christ has come to reveal, to expose, to bring those areas out of us, relieve us of the guilt and shame, to provoke it, he allows us to, to experience it so that we can become repentant in our hearts and come to know him, but ultimately he's trying to pull us out of the depth of sin and shame and bring us into holy conviction so that we can walk in the very righteousness of Christ Jesus. So, James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Notice that it doesn't say that you may be forgiven. Why is that? because Jesus is the only one that can forgive you of your sins. But when you ad adhere and understand the power of confession to another brother, another sister, you harness a power that allows healing to flow. Jesus is the only one that can for forgive and pardon you of your sin, right? He's the only one that's not guilty. He's the only one that, that was, that's worthy to forgive of sins. But when you come to a brother or sister in Christ and you adhere to the power of, of confession and just get something out, I'm not talking about go tell the whole church, but come to a trusted brother, a trusted sister, a leader, a mentor, uh, a spiritual parent, come to somebody and confess that thing, bring it up so that it can come out. There's power of healing that releases. There's emotional healing that can flow in that place, in that atmosphere, even though Jesus is ultimately the only one that's going to forgive you of that, that trespass, that, that iniquity. You can come to a place of emotional healing as well because with sin comes the feeling of guilt and shame. With sin comes the feeling of bondage, of, of, of uh, you know, it, it, it wraps and ensnares our mind and we dwell on it. That thing can lift as soon as you get it out in the open and confess it with a brother and they lay their hands and pray for you. That thing will, get, that, that thing will be lifted off of you and you'll walk in a place in a level of emotional healing that you couldn't have done that had you not confessed it. So there is power in the confession of sins. There is power in getting it out, to, 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 to speak it out, to call it what it is, to identify it as sin and say, devil, you have no place in my life. I have the victory in Jesus and allow a brother or sister to lay their hands and pray you through, amen? amen? So, confessing one to another has the power to break the stronghold of guilt, amen? amen? Next G is grief. Isaiah 53, verse four. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Surely he is born, he is born. What does that word mean? Born means lifted up, carried, means endured, to take on. He's borne our griefs, he's taken the weight of our grief. Grief is, in this, in this translation, and in, in, in what it, the word comes from is wound of violence, affliction, sickness, or disease. Now I believe that he obviously does come to heal our sicknesses, heal our disease. But I believe there's power in, in this, this transliteration of, of knowing and, and relating grief, the feeling of grief that we suffer from a loss, from a painful moment, from a, a circumstance that, that brings great and deep pain. 
that is like a sickness or a disease that you walk with, that you carry. Grief can come in, uh, into somebody's life and absolutely wreck somebody's existence because of the weight and the, the pressure and the pain that comes along with it, the baggage that comes along with it. It feels like a deep wound. If you've ever lost somebody or, or someone dear to you or you've had a, a situation that has completely wreaked havoc on your life as you know it, you know that this, this has a feeling of, of a deep sickness, a deep wound of, of pain. Of, of heartache, of something that, that comes in and, and without, maybe at, at that point you realize it, but sometimes often not, you, you don't realize how much pain has actually taken place and you walk around with this wound just festering and it controls everything about you without you even realizing it, without you even acknowledging it. The word sorrow, he carried our sorrows, means physical and mental pain. So it's not just our bodies that he came to heal. Jesus didn't come just to touch your physical body. He came to touch your mind, your will, your emotions. He came to touch our souls. So, but the places of pain often hurt the worst in the places of our mind and of our emotions. The places of pain often hurt the worst in those places of the mind and the emotions. And when a wound has not fully healed, it can be tender, which causes reaction, which causes if someone touches that pain point, if someone trips up and, 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 and engages with that area of pain, it will inevitably react and respond out of us, right? It's, it comes out because it's just a, it's like an instinct, it's like a reaction of defense, that as soon as we've been hurt, we feel justified to act harshly out of that place of pain. We feel justified because we experienced something that's so deep, that so changed us, that so moved us, that so hurt us, that we feel justified to carry these reactions and responses to everything else about our life now. It's what, it's what it is, it's baggage. More baggage, right? Grief, it's a, it's a, 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 a deep and dark pit in, in, our, in our soul that just carries this burden Everywhere we go, and we've got to identify it. We've got to let, let the light shine and allow him to touch even the hidden places of pain, even the places that we've not let anyone else go to. Jesus has come to extend his reach, has to come to extend his hand on that place and to touch it. Even tonight, we believe you can be free from the, from the burden, from the baggage of grief. Anger, anger, A, anger. James 1, verse 20. For the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Another translation says, does not produce the righteousness of God. There's many scriptures on anger, so I'm just gonna highlight a few. Stop being angry, Psalms verse seven, uh, 37, chapter 37, verse eight. Stop being angry, this is in the NLT. Turn from your rage, do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. It only leads to harm. Anger has a, a way of, of self-harm and harming those around us, doesn't it? Anger, when it's not in, in its rightful place and when there's not just a, a, a holiness about the anger and it's out of wrath, it's out of, out of vengeance, it's out of vindication, it's out of a spirit of anger, it harms everybody in the circumstance, right? It harms everybody around you. So stop being angry, turn from your rage, and do not lose your temper, it only leads to harm. Ephesians 4.26, we love to, to quote this in the church, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Well, the Bible says I can be angry, I just don't need to sit about it. Well, just be careful and slow down and acknowledge what is sin and what is not sin, right? Because just because you're angry doesn't necessarily mean that it's justified, and you've gotta be sure, and we're gonna look at some practical ways that anger expresses itself because we have some preconceived notions sometimes that, well, my anger's justified because I'm not screaming, shouting, and hollering. Well, uh, let's, let's back up and just really understand where, what, what is the anger doing and, and how is it, is it productive anger? Is it anger that comes from a place of, of holy righteousness or is it just an anger that comes from personal preference, right? Is it just an anger that, that's rose up in you 
because you, you see things a different way and you, and you think it, it ought to be done this way, right? So we gotta, we've gotta be stewards of this and understand that it is, a, it is a valid emotion, right? Not saying that you can't have anger. I'm not saying you can't have a righteous, holy anger. I'm not saying that anger won't come upon you, right? All these emotions we'll, we'll experience for a time, but are you carrying the baggage around, right? Are you constantly holding on to this root? So types of anger, there's outward anger, right? We know outward anger because it's obvious. It's the most noticeable. It's verbal and it's physical expressions, the shouting, hitting, violence. Then there's inward anger when we internalize our feelings and it brings, us, brings people to a place of self-hatred, low self-worth, and can lead to isolation and withdrawal. And in some cases, in severe cases, it can lead to self-harm. But this is the one that I wanna look at. There's passive anger. There's passive anger. This is the controlled and often justified anger in our eyes. This is the anger that we most accept, right? Because we like to believe and assume this is the kind of anger that is acceptable because it's not hurting anybody, or so we think. It's not hurting anybody, it's, not, it's just getting the point across, but in a passive way, right? We're being collective, we're being calm about it. Re I'm gonna read this, this is a lot of text, but it just made me contemplate a little bit. It says, passive anger is a way of not expressing anger directly, but instead exhibiting it indirectly through behaviors like sulking, procrastinating, being uncommunicative, ignoring people, or refusing to respond to requests and participate in activities. All these behaviors could be problematic because they do not align with clear verbal cues. So as a person, a person may be outwardly polite and agreeable, but unreliable or noncommittal when it matters. This is the most difficult form of anger to recognize because it can be so asynchronous. It's difficult to put your finger on it because it's so elusive, right? And people can say, well, that wasn't anger, that wasn't out of, out of anger. But that, those passive cues that we like to give, those passive cues, and, and, and we, we all are guilty of it in some, in some way or fashion. You know, I always joke that, you know, I can, I can come home and, and Fallon will ask me to fold laundry or whatever, and if I don't want to do laundry, you know, this is just an example, I always want to do laundry, right? I'm a good husband. <laughs> but if I don't want to do laundry and I've got other stuff I got to do, I can fold that laundry real fast right next to her, right? And make sure she knows I don't, I've, I've, got to, I've got to rush through this and do this because I'm on a time frame, right? I'm on a time crunch. I've got better stuff to do than fold laundry. It's the passive aggression. It's the passive anger. It's those cues that we love to give to let people know that we're angry, we're upset, and we're causing harm. And it's the most difficult to identify. It's the most difficult to put your finger on it, but you know it when you see it, right? And we're all guilty of it at some point, on some level, and we don't realize what baggage we're carrying around when we continuously respond in those kind of ways. When we resort to those kind of actions, we're allowing anger to get the best of us. And we think, well, I'm allowed to be angry, I just can't sin and lash out. Well, the sin of anger has less to do with the actions towards other, the recipient and more to do with the stronghold that it has on you. Yeah. Anger has a stronghold on you and if you're constantly reacting sharply, if you're finding yourself in, and having those unpredictable reactions of, to circumstances, if you're allowing the, 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 your temper to get the best of you, you might want to ask the Lord to help you with this area of baggage. All right, two more, two more. The G is glitz. Glitz is extravagant. I, I had not heard this word uh, or recently, so I had to go look it up after Pastor said it, but it's extravagant but superficial display of showiness. It's with the intent to impress or attract, right? It's the, 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 the come look at me. It's the see me kind of feeling. It's the baggage of I want to be seen because there's something possibly missing in me. The, the, the feeling of affirmation or acceptance is missing at its root in my identity. And maybe it, maybe it was an issue of growing up, a home life, a bad home life, and I didn't receive the acceptance or the emotional acknowledgement or 
the encouragement that I needed or I wasn't celebrated the way that I, I should. Maybe there's a, a root of that somewhere, but nonetheless, there's a feeling or a, a, a desire to be seen. And there's a piece in all of us that enjoys recognition. It's just part of humanity. We all want to be recognized and acknowledged for our successes and celebrated. That there's, a, there's a desire, a natural desire, but we can't allow that to consume us. This is typically, a, a, and, and this, this can consume everything about you without you realizing it. This can, this can bleed into every relationship that you have because you begin to see others as a means to your end. You begin to see others as a stepping stone to get to the next, to, get to, to, to be seen by someone else. You begin to see and approach your relationships maybe just subtly, maybe just in, in, in speech only, but those things begin to reflect inwardly, that you begin to draw the attention. If the conversation is always finding itself back to your successes, then maybe this is an issue of baggage. And I believe we've all carried these, these are all, all these areas of baggage we've probably all picked up at one point or another, right? We probably all have, have experienced. But for some, for some people, different areas are, are struggles for certain people than, more so than other areas, right? We all have different struggles. But you can begin to see others as a means to your end. How, how you begin to see people as a way to get to your destination because you want to be seen by so-and-so and this person and, and there's, there's a me focus. Proverbs 25, verse six and seven in the message says, don't work yourself into the spotlight, don't push your way into the place of prominence for it's better to be promoted to a place of honor than face humiliation or being demoted. It's better to, to force yourself to a place of honor or be promoted to the place of honor than to suffer demotion. And it's difficult for us to acknowledge because for some there's such a deep hunger of affirmation of, and acceptance that's become absorbed into the very identity of somebody. Their mind has completely absorbed this idea that I, I, have, to, I have to get the affirmation and acceptance that's missing. And so it comes out. Perhaps they didn't receive it, perhaps they were abused, whatever the cause may be. There's a me focus, a me center, and it's baggage that portrays in everything, every interaction that you have, whether you realize it or not, it's gonna, it's gonna bleed through and it's going to, to disconnect you and prohibit you from making the, the, the type of connections, relationships, and, and having the longevity and, and going to the place God's called you to go to. Now just proclaim this, that there is no position, there's no title, no platform, no microphone, no social status, no net worth or accolade that can make you any more accepted by the Father in heaven than you already are. Amen. Believe that tonight. Be free from the, 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 the baggage of glitz, the, the, the baggage of wanting to be seen, of wanting to be affirmed. Your Father in heaven is pleased with you, he loves you. There's no title or position that can make you any more loved and accepted by him. He loves you just, just as you are and he wants to bring you into his likeness and character, amen? amen. Expectations, the last one. Specifically, Pastor said, unrealistic expectations. These are expectations that we often receive or incur the most offense from. It's when we have this idea that, well, some, they were supposed to do this, but they didn't, and you didn't even necessarily communicate that they were supposed to do it or that you expected it. It was just unspoken, some kind of unspoken, maybe an interaction, maybe you were expecting so-and-so to shake your hand after church, and they didn't. Uh-oh. And you get offended and you're like, well, I wonder why they didn't shake my hand. I wonder why they didn't speak to me. And we start writing all sorts of fiction in our mind, thinking, well, they must be mad at me or they must be, it must have been that thing I said to them. I knew I shouldn't have said that last week. And we start, you know, we can just spin. I mean, I have written some novels before in my mind about an interaction or something, just something didn't go my way or I was expecting somebody to do something and they didn't do it. And to them, they truly, genuinely had no idea that I was expecting it, right? But I've placed a weight and a burden on them, either then after, maybe I, I acted in a way that communicated, maybe I didn't ever actually come up out and say it, but then that's going to rub our interaction the wrong way, right? Every interaction that I have with that person thereafter, if I don't get free from it, then I'm susceptible to act out of my response to that hurt, that pain, that unexpected or that, that unrealistic expectation that I put on them, right? 
We can't afford to live a life of putting unrealistic expectations on people. Colossians 3 verse 21 says, fathers don't have unrealistic expectations for your children. You've heard it in other translations say, fathers don't provoke your children. Don't provoke your children. Don't provoke your children. It translates in the passion, I love this rendering, it says don't have unrealistic expectations for your children or else they may become discouraged. When we have unrealistic expectations or assumptions of what someone's going to do, we set a mark, unspoken, we set a mark in our mind that they're supposed to achieve this. And if they come anywhere short of that, you're gonna be disappointed and they're gonna be discouraged. Now I'm not saying there's a place for expectation, right? There's a place for standard in God. There's a place to, to hold people accountable. I understand that. I'm not, I'm not got to bring it in balance just to make sure I'm clear. I'm not talking about not holding people accountable, but when it's these unrealistic expectations, it's these things that aren't prompted. They're not, they're not no one was, was supposed to make sure this happened. This was, it, it was not someone, so-and-so's job to make sure out of, everyone that they come and, and speak to you and shake your hand after, after church, right? Or whatever the, the case may be, I'm just using that as an example, but whatever the case may be, we can get offended over the littlest things because we set ourselves up for failure when we put these unrealistic expectations on people and our relationships and our interactions. We can do this with our spouses, expecting them to do something we never communicated to them. Uh-oh. Expecting to make sure we, we make sure that, that they, you know, fulfill something that maybe to them was not, had not a clue in their mind. They had no idea. We do this to each other, to friends, to coworkers. It's unrealistic expectations. And we, we prompt people because then it's at, not only are you creating baggage for yourself that you're ultimately going to carry into your interactions with them and others, you're creating a, a, a baggage level for them too. You're casting baggage, you're casting weight on them rather than being a way of freedom or an access point for Jesus to come in and move in their life, right? So it leads to the trap of making assumptions and writing fiction. Christian, if you'll come on. We, we can come to a place of, we, we, we write all sorts of fiction believing that we're justified in this. We, we know what we've done and this makes sense and, and this is exactly how it went down and we can convince ourselves that it occurred and was supposed to occur a certain way. But when we went unrealistic about it and we, we, we didn't first counsel and say, is this really a, a, a them issue or is this a me issue, right? Is this a me issue? Is this some kind of baggage that I'm carrying? Is this a, 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 an offense that I'm carrying? Is this a, a pain point? Is this a sensitive area for me and this is really more about me getting free and less about them doing what I believe they should have done. All these areas, all these areas that we've talked about, and there's plenty of more that we could have broken down, but they all come in as baggage. They all come in to weigh us down, to keep us from entering into the promised place that he has for us. And with every promise, he, he fulfills all of his promises all of his promises are yes and amen, amen? But he's not obligated to fulfill your potential. Your potential is on you, right? He fulfills all his promises and all of his promises are yes and amen, but the potential he has for you requires an active level of your participation in faith to partner with him to get to the destination that he has for you. You don't, you, you, you're not just going to be able to ride a coattail to the place God has for you. You're not gonna be able to ride a coattail and just hope you can get to where God has a, a promise for you or a word spoken over you or a destination. You've gotta get real and say, Lord, take care of this, this baggage, take care of all this stuff. I wanna actively participate in my faith and believe you for whatever you have for my life. I'm gonna end on this, Matthew, Chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus' word says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, say yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We were designed to carry something. It wasn't the weight of the baggage and the emotional bondage that we so choose to carry often, but it was the yoke of Jesus that he's called us to carry. And I wanna be clear, and you've heard pastors say this, I've heard him preach many messages on this and reference this. There, though, his, though Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light, there is still a yoke and there's still a burden, right? There's still a weight. There's still a weight of, of expectation that, that, that God, these aren't, that he doesn't have unrealistic expectations of us, right? Anything that he expects of us, he, he's faithful to provide and make and, and provide grace to fulfill, right? He's, he sent his son so that we might become the righteousness of God, not in and of our own self, not in and of our own, our own flesh, but by his spirit, right? But though his yoke is easy and his burden is light, there is still a yoke and there's still a burden. Let's go ahead and stand tonight. The yoke, if you remember, is a device in agricultural society. It's a large wooden bar that was placed upon the necks of a pair of oxen, right? And what it was used to was used to unite and combine the two together for a purpose of pulling in the same direction. So when Jesus says, take my yoke, he's talking about a partnership where the yoke comes resting upon you as a means to unite with him and pull in the same direction. In order for him to apply his yoke upon you, he's gotta get some baggage off your shoulders, right? He's gotta clear the way. He says, come to me, all who are heavy laden, all who are burdened, all who labor, and I will give you rest. I will give you my rest. It's not a rest of inactivity. It's not a rest of, of stagnation, but it's a rest of his glory, of his presence, of his grace to operate in the rhythms. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a rest of freedom, amen? Where we live and achieve the level of freedom that Christ paid for on the cross by accepting his yoke around our neck so that we could be yoked up with him and united, a united front, pulling in the same direction as Jesus Christ, to partner and work with him in the same direction that he's taking us. That's the desire of his heart, that you'd come to him, that you wouldn't try to do it on your own, you wouldn't try to carry all your baggage around and tell everybody about it and let it come through every interaction. No, he wants you to be a witness for his kingdom, right? He wants you to be a, a, an ambassador of heaven, he wants you to be a, a, a Christ follower. He wants you to be someone who he can rely on to get his gospel message to the world. But in order to do that, you can't be carrying around all the things that ensnare you, the, the, the weights. In order to do it effectively and efficiently, we've gotta to learn to let go. Let go of the baggage. So tonight, I just wanna encourage you. We're gonna worship the Lord for a few minute, moments here. And I just wanna encourage you, wherever you are, this altar is open, you can feel free to come. If you've got baggage that you just need to lay down, any of these areas, if any of these areas have been highlighted tonight and pointed out an area of baggage in you that you know, or maybe there's an area that the Holy Spirit, that I, maybe I didn't cover, Pastor has it covered, but you know there's an area of baggage in your spirit and you've gotta get freedom tonight. There's no better place than right here, right now, amen? So I'm gonna ask Christian to play and lead us tonight and I just wanna remind you that the gospel of Jesus is about an exchange. The gospel of Jesus is about an exchange. We exchange our weakness for his strength. We exchange our rags for his garments of righteousness. We exchange our baggage for his yoke. So let's worship the Lord in this moment and just whatever you have to do, whatever it looks like, if you've gotta to come to the altar, if you've gotta make an altar wherever you are, just take a moment and allow the Lord to lift the baggage, let go, ask him for grace, to let go of those things that are weighing you down, the emotions, the anger, the grief, all the, all the things we cover. Let those things lift off of you and be, bring you to a place of freedom in Christ. So let's worship him tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Your eyes upon Jesus look full on his wonderful face and 
the things of earth will grow strange be dim in the light of his glory and grace oh turn your eyes upon Just receive that freedom right now. Just for the next few moments, just open your arms to him and say, Lord, I want your freedom. I receive your freedom right now. We cast off every weight in the name of Jesus. We cast off every piece of baggage in the name of Jesus. Every emotional burden, Father, I cast it off in Jesus' name over your people. Hallelujah. We declare grace, grace to it in Jesus' name. Baggage be no more over your people, but we declare the release of freedom over every life, over every heart, over every mind and state of mind, Father. Let there be peace in Jesus' name. We cast our cares upon you, Lord. We cast our affections, our feelings upon you and declare that you are Lord over it all in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You feel that in this place tonight? He's lifting every burden, every bit of shame, guilt, every bit of anger, every bit of, it's just melting like wax in his presence. And we just say thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, if you've received tonight, can you give the Lord Jesus a shout of praise as Sean comes to close us out. Hey Amen. That was such a good word. You know, I was uh, reminded of, uh, as uh, Caleb Buck was ministering tonight, John 8, 31 and 32, Then Jesus said those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So during this series, God has display some truths that's even in, you know, in my life, he just, the Holy Spirit's shown a lot in some areas because he wants us free. So this word comes forth because he loves us. He wants to promote us. But before he does that, he wants us to be free. You can go and be seated for a moment. I do have a few announcements. Um, uh, this Saturday, the 27th, is Ladies, It's Your Heart to Hearth. Amen. Get, yeah, be sure to come to that. Uh, also, we have this Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, so be sure and get here. We have our 9 and 11 o'clock services, uh, men. Coming up, uh, June 9th and 10th, men, it's Forge. Whatever you need to do to get here, get here. It's going to be going to be very, very good. Um, also, this coming up Monday, we're having our Memorial Day picnic. So there's a food sign up at Seeds, and there's also a softball game sign up out there. 
Now, tonight's the last night to sign up because I'm going to take that home and I'm going to give divvy out those teams as equally as I can. I will, I will take donations if somebody is wanting to win. I'm kidding. I'm teasing. I'm kidding. I'm teasing. But I will take it home tonight. So it's the last night to sign up. Uh, uh, for that, there's a lot that signed up. It'll be a fun time um, in the presence of the Lord and fellowship with brothers and sisters. Uh, also, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give before we leave. So Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So what happens when we give to the Lord? The Lord bring forth increase. Two of the ushers are going to go ahead and come up. We're going to place the buckets up here. Uh, if you have anything for the building fund, it goes in the buckets with the teal logo. Otherwise, everything goes, else goes in the other bucket. So go ahead and prepare your gifts. I'm going to pray this in a prayer of dismissal, and we'll see you all um, on Sunday. Father God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for, Lord God, the freedom that's in this place, Lord God. We open up our hearts to you, Lord God. We ask you to bless this giving, this night, Lord God, we proclaim increase in the name of Jesus. We just pray that everybody goes in the, in the grace of the Lord Jesus. Amen. You're going to bring forth your gifts at this time.